It's no secret that Manchester United are in the market for a number nine, and when you're trying to compete at the elite level, that means you're going to end up spending more than £100 million on a player. But they clearly don't have the money available right now, and so in the meantime, they've been linked with Rasmus Hoyland of Atalanta for fees between £50 and £70 million. Pounds. Now, that is still a lot of money, which raises the question, is Hoyland actually worth it for Man United? But in order to talk about the worth of a player, we have to think about what they would offer on the pitch. So let's have a think about what Rasmus Hoyland brings to Manchester United. Now, Eric Ten Hag wants his number nine to do a few very specific things. The first thing is pinning centre-backs. So on the board in front of me, this is a hypothetical Manchester United 11. This is how they set up under Eric Ten Hag. Here is the striker. Now, what he wants the striker to do is to operate around the centre-backs and actually manipulate the position that they're in. That's what I mean when I say pinning the centre-backs. Now, there's a number of different ways that you can do that. One way that you can do that is by playing off the shoulder of the last man. So if the opposition back line is quite high, you want your striker to be in this sort of area, ready for the ball over the top. And Hoyland is perfect in these scenarios because he has a load of pace. He's able to get in behind and get into these 1v1 situations with goalkeepers. But of course, pinning isn't just about exploiting space in behind. It's also about creating space for your teammates. So what Eric Ten Hag will want from his number nine is for them to get into the box, drag centre-backs with them, and then you're opening up a huge amount of space here on the edge of the D. And when you have players like Eriksen, Mason Mount, Bruno Fernandes in these spaces, they can be really productive there as well. Now at Atalanta, Hoyland has been a bit of a channel runner. That means that he likes to get into these sorts of areas. That's because Atalanta are quite a direct attacking team. So it often means that he can be quite isolated around the opposition goal. So he will often find the spaces out wide, hold the ball up, then wait for his teammates to get into the box to be able to play them in. For Manchester United, this would be a bit of a problem because he is the focal point of this attack. So if he does move into these wide areas, there's no one in the box to hit. But it's important to remember that that's probably a team play style issue because although Manchester United are also quite a direct attacking team, they have really elite wingers who can play in those wide areas and do a lot of that work, meaning that Hoyland can focus his attention in the central spaces. And that's important because the second thing that Eric Ten Hag wants from his striker is the ability to do hold up play. Now this can happen in a number of different ways. Last season, we saw Man United using the striker as a hold up option from the back. So if they were having trouble in build-up, they could get the ball long. And if you have a player like that Veghorst in that instance who can bring your teammates into play, then you've been able to progress the ball down the field quite nicely. But it's also important for the Man United striker to do hold-up play in settled possession. So if the midfielders have the ball, the ability to play the ball to the striker, who could be maybe really tightly marked by a centre-back, but who can then play these little passes into teammates so that they can progress the ball through the holes in the defence, that's really important too. And again, Hoyland would be perfect for this because he has the physicality to be able to hold up opposition players and also has the technical ability to be able to bring his teammates in. Now, he is sometimes a little bit too reliant on his physicality and he can sometimes lack a bit of the technicality as well. But these are things that you would hope that a player as young as Hoyland, who's only 20 years old, remember, will be able to develop in time. Which brings us to the final aspect of what Eric Ten Hag wants from his number nine, and that is for his number nine to be a goal threat. Manchester United need a striker who's going to operate around the box, is going to get a lot of chances and is going to score a lot of goals. Now, we've already said that Hoyland is really good at getting in behind defences and scoring goals in that way so the transitional side of the game is no problem whatsoever but when you're a team like Manchester United you do come up against a lot of teams who are going to sit deep in a low block and just make it really really hard for Manchester United to do anything around the box they're going to try and overload in these areas and that does mean that if you have players like Bruno Fernandes or Christian Eriksen playing sitting in these half spaces and looking to flight the ball in that you need to have a striker who's going to be clinical in these situations and that is a question with Hoyland because he hasn't played for a team where that's really been an issue. But the most important thing here is goal scoring. Manchester United need a number nine who is going to get a lot of shots and a lot of goals. So let's dig into the data to see what Hoyland offers. So this is Hoyland's shot map in Serie A last season for Atalanta. And it's worth noting from the off that this is only 1800 minutes worth of playing time for Hoyland. That's around 20 games in total. So if you extended these figures across a full 38 game season, you'd be expecting Hoyland to get closer to 16 goals in total. That just by way of context. But beyond that, we can see lots of of nice things about this shot map. One of the things to notice is how high his expected goals per shot is. That's a figure of around 0.18. That means that you're expecting him to score from one in about every five shots. And the reason for that, the reason why this is such a high figure, is because you can see his shot locations are really good. He's only got three shots from outside the box all season. That means he's taking shots closer to goal. And that means he's more likely to finish. But it is also worth noting that this shot map doesn't tell us what kind of chances were created in each instance. We can't see if it's a crowded box or whether or not these are chances generated in transition. And Hoyland's goal scoring numbers show up really nicely against his peers as well. So this is a chart which shows all of the under 23 forwards with 900 plus minutes who played in the top five European leagues 
last season. Now, the way to understand this graph is that anyone above Hoyland is anyone who is scoring at a higher rate of goals per 90 minutes than him this season. And anyone to the right of him is anyone who is putting up better XG than him per 90 minutes as well. So the first thing to notice is that his actual goals are tracking his expected goals. And that means that you're getting a good rate of return from him as a striker. But then if we look at the players who are doing better than him in terms of the expected goal figures, a lot of good teams are showing up. So we've got Ansu Fati at Barcelona, Rodrigo at Madrid. We've got Makoko at Dortmund and then Erling Haaland at Manchester City. These are all very good teams. But then we've got Rasmus Hoyland playing for Atalanta, a team who aren't guaranteed to get Champions League football every season. And he's competing with these sorts of players. So that's a really good sign as well. But if we compare Rasmus Hoyland to another elite striker that Manchester United have been linked with this window, we can start seeing why the valuations between him and that striker are so different. So on the board here, we've got Victor Osman's pizza chart from last season compared to Rasmus Hoyland's chart from the same time period. And the big thing that stands out for me is this blue area here, which we can see is the attacking quadrant of the chart. And the specific metric that stands out here is shot volume. So we've got Victor Osman here with a shot volume percentile of 99 on this chart, compared to only 53% from Rasmus Hoyland. Now, if you prefer the raw figures, Osman is putting up around 4.6 shots per 90 minutes, and Hoyland is only putting up 2.6 shots. Why is this important? Well, more shot volume equals more goals. Victor Osman got 26 goals in Serie A last season, which is 10 goals more than we speculated Hoyland would have got if he'd have played all 38 games. Now, of course, it is worth remembering that a team's playstyle does have an impact on a player's statistical profile. Victor Osman played as an off-the-shoulder striker for Napoli, who won the league, whereas Rasmus Hoyland was playing a lot more as a link-up hold-up player for Atalanta. And we can see that here, his link-up play volume is much higher than Osman. So he is offering an upside outside of pure goal scoring. But as we've said, Manchester United need a player who can score a lot of goals. That is why you spend £100 million on Victor Osman and you spend much less on Rasmus Hoyland. Now we're already getting into the realm of how Manchester United might think about the value of a player. But before we go any further, I just want to give you two caveats. The first one is that player valuation is nothing more than what a club is willing to pay for a player. So there's a sense in which this is entirely speculative. The second thing to say is that we don't know any of the exact figures here and so what we're going to do from here on in is entirely hypothetical. So let's start off with a question. What are a club actually paying for when they buy a player? They're actually paying for the right to play that player for the whole length of their contract and so if we're thinking about a player's fee we have to think about it in terms of that contract. So let's say that Manchester United are going to pay £50 million for Hoyland and they're going to give him a five-year contract. That means that each year they're valuing him at about £10 million. So I've got that on the screen in front of me here. This is Rasmus Hoyland. If he costs £50 million over a five-year contract, you can see each year he's costing Manchester United £10 million. And this is the way that football clubs account for the values of their players in their books. This is actually a process called amortization. You may have heard of it. Now, Victor Osman is going to cost Manchester United more. So let's speculate that they spend £100 million on him, which I think is the best case scenario with Victor Osman. And they gave him a five-year contract. Now his yearly value is accounted at £20 million because he costs twice as much as Hoyland. But of course, it's not just the transfer fee that goes into what a player costs because wages are really important as well. They have become increasingly important as players have been paid more and more. So it's impossible now to think about the value of the player without thinking about the wage of that player as well. Now, as we've already said, Hoyland plays for Atalanta in Serie A. They are a Champions League challenging side, but they actually have a mid-table wage budget. They have a very low wage budget for their output. And on top of this, Hoyland was signed as a young player from the Austrian Bundesliga. And so it's rumored that his wage packet is only around 10,000 euros per week, which is very low indeed. Now, this is really good for Manchester United because that means that they can pay him a much lower wage than they would be paying to Victor Osserman. So let's imagine that Manchester United are able to agree a wage of around £50,000 per week. That means his yearly wage is around 2.6 million pounds. So if we add that to the graph here, we can see that his value doesn't actually jump up a huge amount for Manchester United. On the other hand, Victor Osman is being signed as an elite striker and so would expect elite wages. And so what I've done here is I've added his wage at around £250,000 a week because that's in line with Manchester United's wage structure. But as you can see from the graph, that means that you're adding a huge amount more onto his value. That's £13 million a year more, which is around what you're paying Hoyland in total, including his fee. And if you want to quibble with the values that I've thrown out, then I've made another graph here which shows you what would happen if Hoyland was on £100,000 a week and if Osserman was only on £200,000. Now, as you can see, even in this unlikely scenario, Hoyland is still only costing Manchester United half of what Osserman would be costing. Now, one of the benefits for Manchester United of Hoyland having a lower wage is that it means that they can front load the initial fee if they want. So what I've done in this chart is I've tweaked Hoyland's transfer fee so that Manchester United 
United are now paying 75 million for him, amortized over a five year contract. And so as you can see, even adding 25 million pounds to the initial transfer fee doesn't make a huge difference because that 25 million pounds gets spread out over the course of a five year contract. And so Hoyland is still much cheaper on an annual basis for Manchester United than Osserman would be. And so the big question for Manchester United is, how do you account for this gap in value between how much it would cost to have Osserman and how much it would cost to have Hoyland in terms of what they're gonna to bring to the team, how they're gonna have a rate of return on the field. But it's important to consider as well that we're not just considering the difference between Osserman and Hoyland, we need to also remember that Manchester United only have one number nine, that is Anthony Martial, and he barely played for Manchester United last season. So we need to consider the difference between Hoyland and no striker at all. And how can we think about rate of return on the field? Well, let's have a think about Champions League prize money. So on the board in front of me, I've got the Champions League prize money from last season. Let me just walk you through it because this is quite a complicated table. But in this column here, we have the amount of money that you get from each stage. So if you get into the group stages, you already get 15 million euros to play with. If you get draws in the group stages, you get around a million pounds. If you get a win in the group stages, you get around three million pounds. So in this hypothetical here, if a team gets three wins and three draws in the group stages, they get the 15 million pounds for getting into the group stages and then they get up to 26 million pounds then for getting three wins and three draws in the group stages. That would also mean that they would get through to the next stage likely and that would give them another 10 million pounds here. All of which means that if you get through to the final of the Champions League you're looking at getting a prize money return of between 70 and 85 million euros which is a huge amount of money. Now when it comes to a player like Victor Osserman who commands really high fees you look at this table and you can start understanding how clubs might justify paying that kind of money for him because he can be the difference between getting to a Champions League final or not. But what about Rasmus Hoyland? How can we think about his value in these sorts of terms? Well, if we go back to the original graph that I put up, we estimated that Hoyland would cost Manchester United around £13 million a year, including his transfer fee and wages across the five years of his contract. Now, if we go back to the Champions League prize money table, we can see that even if a team just gets to the Champions League, they're going to pick up around €15 million Euros in prize money, which is around the same sort of fee that we speculated Manchester United would be paying per year for Hoyland over the course of a five-year contract. Which means that if Hoyland can contribute to Manchester United getting regular top four finishes, getting through to the Champions League, he's already accruing back some of his fee per season in prize money. Now, of course, Hoyland isn't going to be the difference between Manchester United getting Champions League and not, but he could be the difference between them getting from the round of 16 to the quarterfinals. If he scores a couple of goals that make that difference, it could be the case that Manchester United pick up an extra 10 million euros. And again, that's a very concrete way of understanding how Hoyland can contribute to his own fee and add a rate of return on the field. And so the difference between Victor Osserman and Rasmus Hoyland is that the stakes are so much lower for Hoyland. He doesn't have to win the Champions League in order to justify his inclusion in Manchester United's wage structure. All he has to do is score some important goals earlier on in the competition. And again, this is a really good argument for Manchester United picking Hoyland over nobody because it won't take that much for him to recoup his value. Just a few performances here and there in the Premier League and the Champions League. Now, if you need more convincing about Hoyland offering value to Manchester United, we just need to have a little think about David De Gea. Now, David De Gea has recently announced that he is leaving Manchester United. He's been at the club since 2011, and they signed him for a fee of around £19 million all those years ago. And that means that since then, most of his transfer value has been amortized away into nothing. So he's basically just being paid a wage, but it was a very big wage. There was obviously those negotiations with the club to try and bring that wage down. But what I thought I would do is compare the speculated value that we'd say Hoyland would cost over five years with the value that David De Gea would have cost if his wage structure had stayed exactly the same. And as you can see, David De Gea was earning by the end around 19.5 million pounds a year, which is well above the fee that Manchester United will be paying for Hoyland over the course of that five year period and also his wages as well. So by removing David De Gea from their wage structure, they've actually allowed space for another player to come in like Hoyland, saving money in the process. Now, obviously Manchester United do need to bring in a new goalkeeper. So a lot of this money will go towards bringing in that player. But the overall point here is that if you compare Hoyland's fee and wages per year against the sort of wage packets that Manchester United are offering players, then you can see that Hoyland Hoyland isn't adding a huge amount to their yearly budget. Now, all the arguments I've made today have operated on the assumption that Rasmus Hoyland doesn't increase in value. If that is the case, then Manchester United are quids in because they probably have an elite striker on their hands and he's worth a lot of money. But because his wages are lower, the risk is much lower for Manchester United, which means they can afford to absorb the initial fee without a huge rate of return. All of which means Rasmus Hoyland is absolutely worth it for Manchester United. If you like this video, please consider subscribing to the channel.
The Athletic is home to some of the world's best sports journalists, including journalists dedicated to each Premier League team, so every fan gets the coverage they deserve, not just the big clubs. And you can try it for free now for 30 days. See the link in the description.